So hi. For those of you new to this study, I'm Margot Rocks, and I've been in this church for over 40 years. Some of you can raise your hands and say, I can beat you. Yeah, I know, that I, I see that hand. <laughs> um, it's good to be back with you as we explore God's word together. And let us pray before we examine what God has put on my heart for you today. Heavenly Father, we know your word can light our path and reveal your truth to us. Help us to open our minds and break through any strongholds of opinion that are not in line with how you want us to live for you. Thank you for the opportunity to openly discuss these truths with others and grow in our knowledge of you. Amen. So today we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the words of Paul as he teaches and admonishes the new church there. This is the close of his argument against favoritism. Remember, we've been looking at how we can have the mind of Christ amid the confusion in our broken world. The church is a community centered around Jesus, and its leaders and members are his servants. The first two verses reveal how Paul wanted the Corinthians to view the apostles and leaders in the church. He insists on maintaining a balanced view of others, and we can also apply this to how we view ourselves. The first two verses are key to this whole chapter. I don't know if any of you, when you were a student in school, used the skimming technique, you know, read the the first and the last paragraph of a chapter so that you can get through your homework faster. I did, I did did that. Um, But open your Bibles if you wish. We're going to, uh, you can follow along as I read 1 Corinthians Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. We've been looking at how the church was picking favorites. They were taking sides. Paul did not want to be looked down upon. Neither did he want them to exalt him. This is a struggle we continue with today, isn't it? I like it when so-and-so preaches. I like this type of music. Or when that person sings. I want to be part of this Sunday school class. This youth leader or this Sunday school teacher is not doing it the way they did it before. We make our personal preferences equal to the truth of God. And yes, we might find one method or teacher that style draws us more than another. But we should be careful not to make judgment based on our likes and dislikes. So how does Paul say they should see him and his fellow leaders? First, as servants. Now the Greek word used here is hyperites. That describes a subordinate functioning as a free man, rather than the word doulos, which designates a common slave. Servants serve the master and furthered the plans of their master. They followed their directions and they didn't hesitate in doing what his master was asking them to do. He points out here he's also a servant of Christ. All the characteristics of what a servant does for their master, furthering God's plans, following his directions without hesitation, is how Paul views his position before Christ. The second thing he asks them to view him as is a steward. The stewards were managers of households. This role not only served the master just as a servant does, but they are above the other servants and slaves. 
directing them how to fulfill the plans the master wishes them to fulfill, keeping abreast of the needs of the household and giving account to the master. Here he points out he is a steward of the mysteries of God. His task was to dispense the truth of God. When he was questioned or when we are questioned, we need to determine if what we are sharing is God's truth. The key to Paul's purpose as a steward is to be found faithful. For the master to trust the steward, they must be efficient managers of the master's resources. They must be found faithful or trustworthy. They didn't own the property or resources. They simply managed them for their master. When they did so effectively, the master could trust them. Sometimes pastors, leaders, and even congregants look at the church as belonging to them, when the truth of the matter is we are just stewards. The church belongs to Christ. How well are you stewarding the church where God has placed you? We can look at Jesus' parable of the master who gave his servants differing amounts to steward for him. There's one story in Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30, and another in Luke 19, 11 through 27. In each of these stories, when the master returns from his trip, he evaluates and de determines whether they were faithful and how they used their assigned talents. Well, we too have talents. Are you faithful with them? What has God given you to use for his kingdom? Do we serve God stintingly or with courage and boldness that honors what he has done in our lives? I encourage you to be honest with yourselves about your talents. I'm talking about examining the talents that you see God using, and more importantly, those areas that your life that you don't value. I hear women often demeaning themselves by comparing themselves with others. Shame on you. God didn't make mistake when he created you. You aren't missing out because you don't have the same gifts as someone else. You skills that you admire in someone, it's sometimes hard not to envy someone who seems to require little effort in their lives and are gifted in ways that we wish we were First of all, you don't know what their personal demons might be or whether they struggle behind their smiles. Second, in focusing on others, we're missing what God's purpose for our own lives are. It can be as simple as cuddling a baby in a nursery so the mom can get some peace and quiet while she worships. Or we can make a meal or send a pizza to someone who has um, someone in the hospital. We can give a ride to someone who's no longer driving or go and visit with them since they're no longer able to go out on their own. Those are just a small sample of little things that can be the hands and feet of Jesus for someone. Doing a small act of service for others in needs, even if it goes unnoticed. These are just as important as the more visible ministries of preparing a message, providing special music, or being part of a leadership team. We need the leaders, or I might say the movers and the shakers, but it might, might not be the place God has called you to serve. And I think those who assist are often more valuable than those that we notice that are doing the leader and actions of up front. One of my favorite stories is the man that let Paul down by the basket to escape we never know his name. We don't know anything about him. We just know that he rescued Paul. And we wouldn't be reading this if he wasn't rescued. So those little things matter just as much. Also, we're often called to serve in new ways in different seasons of our lives. How do we serve when we're younger with more energy? Or if we have small children, we're pouring our lives into them. What can we do when we have limited financial resources? 
or on the flip side, if we are blessed with income beyond what we need for our daily requirements? Can we still be servants when we cannot move about as freely? And we need someone else to meet some of our basic needs. These are questions you need to take to God in prayer as you strive to be stewards of what God has given you. I've been struggling a bit with how to fill in my new role in this season of life called retirement. Now, there are many things that I would like to do, and there are many things that I really would rather not do, but sometimes I make choices based on my personal preference rather than seeking God to find out what he would love me to be doing for him. One of my great inspirations for how to live is Corey Ten Boom. I bring her up regularly when I'm teaching about forgiveness. But Marge, Marge Pressy loaned me a book written about Corey's last days. She was unable to continue traveling or do anything on her own due to a series of strokes. The book is called The Five Silent Years of Corey Ten Boom. This period of her life, she yielded to the situation God placed her in. She was even able to share the love of Christ with many who came to visit her when she was bedridden. This woman wanted all her days to count. And I see in her example that there is never a time <clears throat> when we're not able to be stewards of the talents God has given us. Excuse me. <clears throat> Paul goes on to talk about how the people of Corinth were judging him and lets them know in no uncertain terms that God is the only one who has the right to judge him. We should not condemn ourselves, nor should we judge others. When we have others who are leading and serving us, we need to examine their lives sometimes, but mostly judging is not what God would want us to do. So whether we're being judged by others or are participating in judging, we need to step back and allow Christ to be the one who gives the praise or condemnation. Now, I know some of you are going to struggle with what we see as our right to judge because you know we need to decide if someone or something is in line with scripture. So we figure we have a right to judge. <clears throat> but let us take a moment to examine the difference between judging and discerning. Judgment has a sort of this is the final answer feeling, which closes us off to receptivity and the possibility of mutual understanding. Discernment, on the other hand, is responding from love rather than reacting, and we can make appropriate choices for ourselves and for the good of others. To judge, as Jesus used the term, means to act as the final interpreter of a person's character and the final authority over a person's eternal outcome. In this way, we are using judgment to act in place of God, as if we know all the secrets of another's heart and could take wise and inclusive action in regard to their heart. That act of judging is an arrogant assumption that you or I can be the final judge of someone else's entire person. This is what Paul is implying that Jesus intends us to avoid. If for no other reason, and there are more reasons, than that it is impossible for any of us to know all that is in another person's heart, we don't even know what's in our own heart or to know with any degree of certainty at all what the final outcome of someone else's life might be. Discerning is a conscious effort to carefully and considerately explore the moral right and wrong of a situation or an opinion or an action with the desire in the end to honor God and serve those involved. Discernment pursues the understanding of what is morally right and what is morally wrong and unacceptable to God. <clears throat> Notice this. Discernment is not about deciding whether one person thinks another person is right or wrong. 
Discernment is about understanding what moral position God holds in relation to the question under discussion. When personal opinion is elevated to the same status as God's word, bickering and division will result. Paul points out that even believers are far from perfect, and we are reminded that the good in our lives is a gift from God. In today's world-driven culture, we need to beg God to show us his truth and how we might be allowing the opinions of the world to sway us. The next section we get into is laced with sarcasm. Now, it's harder to catch sarc sarcasm in a written text. And we can only be picked up on the context of the story. Most of the sarcasm we encounter is in tone or expression. Some of us still have difficulty picking up on sarcasm, even when it may be obvious to others. I don't love everything about the Big Bang Theory TV show, but I can sometimes relate to Sheldon's need for Leonard to hold up a sign with the word sarcasm behind him when he's talking to Penny because he doesn't get when Penny is using sarcasm. Or uh, an older cartoon, if you remember Foghorn Leghorn, he's a big rooster and he's talking to this little guy and he goes, it's a joke, son, it's a joke. If we, if we need to be told we're, we're, we're missing it. So it's easy to misinterpret words and intentions of others. Sometimes our best intentions or actions or comments can, be, can hurt rather than affirm. And this can happen when we base our opinions and interpretations of their speaking on our own life experiences because what we've experienced in our lives colors how we hear what other people say. With contrast after contrast, Paul sarcastically shows how foolish it is for the Corinthians to think that they are more spiritually privileged, blessed, or endowed than the apostles were. He shares that he's more apt to face humiliation and deprivation than the puffed up position they seem to be striving for. He also doesn't really care how others view him and is willing to be considered foolish in order to fill, fully serve God's purposes. We often want to, uh, to take the Bible as a pristine narrative of proper behavior and feelings. Well, if you've read the Bible, you know it constantly gives us a complex picture of behavior and feelings. People don't live exemplary lives. And instead, it shows us their experiences of both success and failure, living according to the path God would have them to follow. There are so many examples of God's people messing up, I'm not even gonna try to mention them. This entire letter was written to examine some of the missteps of the people of this early church. They weren't really following some of the things that Paul had taught them on how to, what it means to follow Christ and put aside the cultural norms of both the Greek and the Jewish beliefs. So in this moment, Paul is using sarcasm to get their attention. Now, people of God lived in a wide spectrum of emotions, and we experience many of these as well. The shortest and a well-known verse, Jesus wept, shows his sorrow. Jesus also talked about laughter. In John 6, 21 and following, Jesus teaches about some of our life circumstances. He says, looking at his disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. 
So leaping for joy reminds me a little bit of King David when he leapt before the ark when it was being paraded into Jerusalem. Um, so, but I'm going to pull back from this rabbit trail on emotions that I've taken you on. But I want to mention how much I love how the chosen films show Jesus laughing, dancing, tired, distraught, and exhibiting a life full of varied emotions. They even have him teasing the disciples. So why was Paul laying it on so thick? So to speak about the Corinthians, their behavior was creating factions and divisions in the church. Why did he seem to be so frustrated and want to like bang his head on his hand? Like, what are you thinking, people? And then, of course, if you're NCIS fans, it's the gib slap where you get slapped on the back of the head when you're acting stupid. So he is lacing his exhortation with sarcasm, probably due to the focus on their own choices rather than Christ. Looking back to what we have already examined, Paul was insistent that they develop the mind of Christ. How is that done? By study, by following one leader over another? Well, some of it's a good choice, some of it's not. In some situations, we need to seek God and his kingdom as our primary focus with the help and assistance of other teachers. Paul longs for his strong words to help them change the course of their lives because they had gotten off track. That's the purpose of meeting together with one another and digging into his word and discussing it. We need wisdom of leaders and teachers to help direct our thoughts and conversation toward being stewards of his word not to develop fan clubs, so to speak, of one teacher or leader over another, even though the world does include, encourage this behavior. We see this especially during times of elections, which we're going through now, and types of decision-making for, decision for governments or school, or whenever a policy or a group needs to make a change. Our church recently made some changes in our bylaws, and there were still differing opinions in our congregation after that decision was made. A church dear to my heart is going through some very difficult leadership struggles. Following Christ does not guarantee unity of mind. However, we need to seek God's wisdom. And um, I'm lost. Sorry. We need to seek God's wisdom even when the world looks at it as foolishness. The cross of Jesus Christ must be the foundation of the church. Our focus needs to be on Jesus. We strive for what the psalmist says in chapter 133, verse 1, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We can only do this when we put aside our own agendas and ask Christ to guide our steps. In closing, I want to share a discovery I made about coming together with people that weren't quite the same, but had something in common. Two stories with the same theme. When I was working in Boston, one of my coworkers was from Catalonia in Spain. She was a vibrant personality and exuberant in her sharing of stories. One day, she related how she spent the evening with some people who were from Catalonia living in the US. She frankly stated that if they were at home rather than together in the US, they would not have anything to do with each other because of their differences in class and life situations. But here, since they had a homeland in common, they became instant friends. At another time when David and I were traveling in Europe, we were mostly in German speaking countries and he spoke some German, which I didn't. I was mostly left out of the conversations. One evening, we went to a cafe that had a group of young adults from various countries who did not speak each other's language, so the common language was English. I was ecstatic. I could finally talk and converse with other people while we were overseas. 
It was a group of people I didn't know, and I didn't really learn anything in depth about who they were or what they were, their purposes were, but we had a wonderful evening enjoying one another's company. The commonality was English. In our church, our commonality is our belief in Christ's sacrifice on the cross to unite us in the bond of faith. Therefore, be willing to listen and to seek under, to understand one another. And may we bring our beliefs in alignment with scripture as we study together. Paul wanted them to grow from his chastisement and to become true stewards of the gospel to the word of Christ, looking forward to when he returned. Are we looking forward to Christ's return? Will he say to us, well done, good and faithful servants? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue to dig into your word together, help us to see how to be good stewards of your church and the word that you have given us, the truth of your word. Help us to bring those who are struggling the, the gospel of your love for them. Continue to work in our lives as we support one another through the struggles that we face. And thank you for the fellowship that we have here in this study and throughout our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies. Any announcements?